During the summer of 2015, students gathered from different parts of the United States and Mexico in the small pueblo of Yashuna, Yucatan, to attend the Ethnobotany Field School that was held at the village's community culture center. While there, we learned many things from the teachers about how to identify, protect, and conserve plants in the area, about the cultural history of the ancient Maya, and the importance of the stingless bees to both the local ecology and to Maya culture. Since ancient times, the Maya people have had a special relationship with corn. Information recorded in glyphs and sculptures from Maya archaeological sites, as well as the creation story in the Popol Vuh, Fernando Pacheco's murals in the state capitol building in Merida, and even the mural in Yashuna's culture center all tell different parts of the same story. That story says that the Maya literally came from corn and still to this day have a special relationship to the natural and supernatural world that supports the Maya people in raising corn and continuing the traditional basis of Maya village life. The ancient Maya were keen observers of the natural world around them, and that process has continued to the present time. They saw different gods at work in nature and the need to honor and provide sacrifices to the gods so that in return, the gods would favor them by providing the Maya people with the necessities of life. One of their most critical needs was for water. The Yucatan Peninsula is a low, flat, limestone landmass with generally poor soil and very few lakes or rivers. And one of the most critical times when water is needed is at planting time. Without rain, there will be no crop. One of the highlights of the field school was being invited by elders of the community to attend the final day of the three-day Chachak ceremony on Sunday, July 26th. The Chachak ceremony is designed to show appreciation and sacrifice to the ancient gods, and in particular to the rain god Chak, so he will send the much-needed rain. Rains usually begin in early June, but this year had been unusually hot and dry. Some farmers had planted about four weeks ago, but rain had been scarce since then. Other farmers had not yet planted their corn. People were getting nervous. The situation had grown critical. The Chachak ceremony was organized under the direction of Don Rufino, a local leader in the Catholic community in Yashuna. They had arranged for the ceremony to be conducted by Don Aurelio, a shaman, or men in Mayan, from the nearby pueblo of Cancapsonot. A great deal of preparation must go into a chachak ceremony. Things must be done right or chak will not feel honored and the rains will not come. By the third and final day of the ceremony on Sunday, much had already been accomplished. A traditional altar had been created in the forest outside the village that featured twin arches at each end made out of small habin trees tied together at the top. Five sets of tacanil vines connected the altar to the rest of the forest and by extension to the heavens above. Don Aurelio explained that the five tacanil vines were for the five main directions of the ancient Maya cosmology. One for each of the four ordinal directions plus a fifth vine for the center. The legs of the altar rested on the forest floor and, by extension, to the underworld below. The top of the altar itself represents our location in the full Maya cosmos. Thus, the altar with all its connections above and below provides both a physical map of the cosmos and a medium through which communication can occur with the gods. A corn plant was planted in the earth at each of the six legs of the altar, and several candles were placed along the perimeter of the altar space on the ground. By early Sunday morning, the shaman had already covered the top of the altar with habin leaves 
from the same tree that formed the arches at each end of the altar. He had also placed a large bucket on top of the altar that contained sacred water that had been gathered from a cave that sunlight had never entered. Alternating hecora bowls contained balche and saka. Balche is a fermented liquor made from the sacred balche tree, honey, sugar, and water. Saka is a gruel of ground corn mixed with the sacred water. Elements to enhance that communication and to please the gods included burning incense in an incensario, the smoke rising through the air to reach the gods. Also, special herbs were gathered to please the gods and to ask for good health and healing for both adults and children of the village. Branches of each takanin and sipche were also used by the shaman to express the prayers of the community. The men of the village contributed different types of food so that food offerings could be made to the gods and also so the community could enjoy a celebratory feast at the end of the ceremony. A full accounting was made to record how many chickens, kilos of corn, or bags of spice were donated to the ceremony by each person. Earlier in the ceremony, the men of the village had already hunted and killed a deer, and the meat had been cooked in preparation for the ceremony. Each of these ingredients was blessed at various stages of preparation by the shaman. The process of making the tortillas of corn and squash seed was very involved and required the participation of all the men who were helping conduct the ceremony. All the ground corn, or masa, was placed on clean mats on the ground and mixed together by several men until just the right consistency had been obtained. At the same time, another person made a mixture of ground squash seeds, salt, and water from the sacred cave. Then the shaman blessed each mixture before the men began making tortillas from the masa and then smearing them with the squash seed mixture. The tortillas were then wrapped in bob leaves and made ready for baking in an underground fire called a pib. Next came the process of blessing and then killing the chickens for the ceremony. Each chicken was brought up to the shaman, one at a time, by its owner and held upside down. The shaman gave each man a single habin leaf, which he used to cradle the bird's head and force its beak open. The shaman blessed the bird and put 13 spoonfuls of saka into each chicken's mouth. Each man then took his chicken over to the side and killed it, usually by strangulation. The dead chickens were then put on the bed of a triciclo to be taken to the women waiting elsewhere for plucking and cleaning. Late in the morning, the men cut down firewood to use for cooking the food and created a fire in the peeb that had already been dug for that purpose. The prepared food was placed on top of the hot rocks and coals in the peeb and then buried for a few hours. When we returned to the ceremony in mid-afternoon, the cooked food was ready to be used in the ceremony. Some of the cooked chickens and small cooked cornbreads were placed carefully on the altar for the gods. Then 13 very large cooked cornbreads were placed on a clean cloth. Men broke them open and used wooden spoons they had just made to scrape out the inside of the bread and mix it with some of the soup from the large buckets. They then divided the rest of the food into serving portions that would be given to everyone who was present at the end of the ceremony. 
The last step in preparing for the ceremony itself involved the shaman instructing the young boys of the village in how they should conduct themselves during the ceremony in their roles as young frogs. For centuries, the Maya people had noticed that just as birds seemed to call the morning into being at dawn, that frogs seemed to call for water with their croaking. Frogs need water, and their calls should be heard by the gods. With the stage fully set, the final ceremony began at approximately 4 p.m. The skies were mainly blue with only a few light clouds in sight. The shaman began praying, and the young men seated under the altar started making frog sounds. From time to time, they also struck the posts of the altar with wood that they had carved in the shape of machetes and rifles. It is believed by some that these are probably some sort of vestigial symbols that refer back to the caste war of resistance that had engulfed the area in the mid-19th century. After approximately 45 minutes of continual praying, the shaman got down on his knees and raised food offerings to his shoulder. Soon the skies began to darken, winds began to stir, and the sound of thunder could be heard in the distance. The pace and intensity of the ceremony increased. The shaman gestured more urgently, each movement of his arm seemingly trying to coax the rain out of the sky. Then he circled the altar, with his eyes always on the sky above. The expressions of the other men in the ceremony changed as well. Hope was in the air. The ceremony continued at that same level for another few minutes, and then the shaman signaled it was over. The men and the boys at the altar retired to an area of the forest behind the altar. And almost immediately, the skies opened up and the rains began drenching the altar. All visitors at the ceremony gathered under the nearby tarp to stay dry, and where we were soon served plates of food from the ceremony. <laughs> the food was delicious, and the rain was wonderful. On that day, the people had come together, and their prayers for rain were answered. They had shared with each other and with the gods their commitment to continuing the traditions of being the people of the corn. That is what we saw, and that is what we are still trying to learn from. As visitors to the community, we are extremely grateful to Don Rufino and Don Aurelio and to all the people of Yashuna for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to attend this Chachak ceremony and to share what we have learned with others who may view this video in the future. Muchísimas gracias por todo.